Hello and welcome to our final session that is part of the Sorrel APPC and Wilson Center Polar Institute Circling the Arctic Conference. My name is Alexandra Mize and I am a senior fellow at Sorrel, the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law at the University of Pennsylvania. We have put together this conference in partnership with the Annenberg Public Policy Center, also known as APPC, and the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center. And we are immensely grateful to them for their support and participation in this conference. Uh, Sorrel is, the, is a nonpartisan interdisciplinary institute dedicated to preserving and promoting the rule of law in 21st century national security, warfare, and democratic governance. Searle draws from the study of law, philosophy, and ethics to answer the difficult questions that arise in times of war and other contemporary conflicts. To that end, we hold events, conduct research, and produce publications that educate the public and decision makers on vital ethical and rule of law issues. Today's thorny rule of law issue is hard and soft law Arctic governance. And we have a very fine panel to help us address that. But first, we have some housekeeping notes. So we will have in the latter half of today's session, a Q&A from, from the public. To submit a question, please use the Q&A feature found on the ribbon at the bottom of your window. If you're using a desktop, this will appear at the bottom. Please keep your question topical, appropriate, and PG. Anyone posting inappropriate language or content will be removed from the meeting. For the lawyers in our audience, if you are seeking CLE credit for today's event, please remember to fill out your digital evaluation form and include the CLE codes shown in a Zoom poll or as announced during the session today. The evaluation form is mandatory in order to receive CLE credits for your attendance today. There will be one evaluation form per day. So if you attended this morning's discussion between Claire Finkelstein and Senator Angus King and you're attending today, you will need the codes for both sessions on your form. You can find that form in the link that you received uh, from your registration. The, it will also be put in the chat. And with that, I tell you the first passcode of today is elbow. Again, the first passcode for today's session is elbow. Now, we can shift to the topic of our panel. I'm going to introduce the esteemed members of this panel and invite them at this time to turn on their videos so we can see their lovely faces. Uh, I'm going to start with M Ambassador David Balton, who is a senior fellow at the Polar Institute of the Wilson Center a former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans and Fisheries in the Department of State and U.S. Ambassador of Oceans and Fisheries. In that role, he coordinated U.S. foreign policy concerning oceans and fisheries, as well as issues related to the polls and oversaw uh, U.S. participation in international organizations dealing with these issues. He's in, been involved in the negotiation of numerous agreements on behalf of the United States, including serving as a co-chair of Arctic Council Task Forces on the Arctic Search and Rescue Agreement, Arctic Oil Pollution Agreement, uh, et cetera. And uh, we are very excited to have him as our moderator for today's session. We have three discussants. The first is the Honorable Inu Tekholm Olson, who is the head of representation for Greenland to the United States and to Canada. Uh, prior to coming to Washington, D.C., where he is based, he was at the Danish Foreign Ministry as a senior advisor for Greenland and Arctic Affairs. He has a long career in foreign affairs for Greenland and Denmark, previously having served as the deputy minister in the for the Department of Foreign Affairs of the Government of Greenland and head of department at the Department of Foreign Affairs. He has a strong U.S. connection, having earned his undergraduate and graduate degrees in the United States from the University of Alaska Fairbanks and George Washington University, respectively. Our next discussant is Dr. Adélie sambo Duro. She is the International Chair of the Inuit Kasukram Polar Council and, and also a Senior Scholar and Special Advisor on Arctic Indigenous Peoples at the University of Alaska Anchorage. 
Dr. Duro has a long history of direct involvement in the discussion, debate, and negotiation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of, of Indigenous Peoples, also known as UNDRIP. Uh, she has been active for decades at all levels of international organizations addressing Indigenous issues. And our third discussion, discussion today is Dr. Lassie Heinenen. Uh, it is very late where you are, Lassie. You're based in Finland. We thank you for staying up to speak with us today. He is a professor emeritus of Arctic politics at the University of Lapland in Finland, a professor of international relations at Northern Arctic Federal University in Russia, editor of the Arctic Yearbook. I, I could go on. Uh, his research spans many fields, and he is a, uh, in, this, in this sphere of geopolitics, international relations, and security, and is a very prolific author with 55 peer-reviewed scientific articles, books, 13 monographs, 140 non-refereed scientific articles, and 120 other publications. Um, I, I am quite um, uh, uh, speechless at, at, at your volume of production. So thank you, uh, Dr. Heinen. And I will now mute, and you will not see me again to the very end. I leave it to our distinguished panel. Thank you so much. Please, David. Thanks very much, Xander. And I want to thank and congratulate University of Pennsylvania, and in particular the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law and the Annenberg Center as well for the entire conference, which has been extraordinary. Indeed, we are the very last session in it, which I take as a great compliment. We have, as you uh, have heard, a session focusing on the rule of law in the Arctic. We hope, to, we hope to explore with you how well the legal arrangements and institutions that now exist in the Arctic are functioning. And I, and I have to say that uh, in 2008, five of the Arctic nations signed what was known as the Lulisat Declaration. And that declaration at that point said that an extensive legal framework applies to the Arctic Ocean. Well, that framework, however extensive it might have been just 12 years ago, has grown considerably since that. Indeed, years from now, people may look back on the decade that just ended as the golden age of Arctic regime building, we saw the coming into force of five treaties, uh, the Arctic Council emerging as a policy shaping, some might even say policy setting body, new institutions like the Arctic Economic Council, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum and others. But are these arrangements and bodies sufficient? Are they really allowing the nations and peoples of the Arctic to confront the challenges of the Arctic effectively? What more may be needed? These are the things on my mind um, as I listen to our th three distinguished speakers. And to start, I would like to pass the floor now to Inatech. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dave. And also thank you to the organizers, especially, especially you and Sandra you know, and the University of Pennsylvania um, uh, for you know, having me on, me on this uh, important topic. Uh, you know, um, we are, you all know that the Arctic is undergoing a lot of changes and, you know, is gaining the attention from a wider audience um, in recent years. And I'm also very glad to be on this panel together with Davey and uh, Lassie, as well as, you know, you, Dave. So, um, it's, I mean, we all been in this game um, for many years, you know, and we have witnessed how, you know, the focus on the Arctic has uh, evolved from uh, environmental security which I think, you know, the ICC should be credited for because the ICC was uh, talking about environmental security before anyone else uh, in the Arctic. To, you know, to climate change, you know, to national security concerns, the role of China, etc. Um, and I mean, especially, I mean, the role, uh, the national security concerns, you know, are taking uh, center stage, but I think, you know, we shouldn't uh, forget or ignore um, the other issues, nor the, should they be. But also, I think, you know, important to keep in mind, you know, that, you know, the Arctic is a very hot environment. And, and if you look at the, for example, the North American Arctic, you know, it's sparsely populated, um, vast geography, you know, just, I mean, you know, Davy is in Alaska, you know, which is uh, in the morning and last year is in Finland, you know, late evening. So, we, you know, we're talking about a, a, a huge area. It's also a, a very hot environment, you know, and so, you know, you have to have a, uh, I think a practical uh, approach uh, when you, um, I mean, with cooperation, when you're dealing with, um, I mean, Arctic issues. Uh, I mean, no country can do it alone, I think, in the Arctic. Um, 
So I think it's important, you know, um, I mean, when we talk about this, you know, I think the people living in the Arctic needs to be at the center. Um, a people-centric centric approach, you know, the role in governance, living conditions, you know, the aspirations, you know, and which take, I think, responsibility for how the Arctic is developed always has to be, I think, the focus. So we, I mean, um, we continue to stress, you know, that, that the Arctic should be an area of peace and cooperation, um, even as we talk about, you know, increased military uh, capabilities, you know, and different national security concerns. But since I'm representing, you know, the government of Greenland, you know, um, uh, we believe in this uh, principle of subsidiarity, that the decisions affecting the people uh, should be taken by the people, you know, directly. In this instance, you know, issues dealing with, uh, for example, Greenlandic uh, and Arctic issues, you know, where we have a lot of stake, you know, we believe that we, we uh, can re best represent our, ourselves when we're dealing with Arctic issues. And we're part of the Kingdom of Denmark, you know, which still has the responsibility of foreign affairs. Um, though, um, I mean, though we can negotiate and enter into uh, international agreements in areas we have taken over responsibility, you know, um, if it is, you know, relegated to Greenland proper and not the whole of Kingdom. So um, we have always, even you know, with the um, advent of the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, which Finland took the initiative on, you know, and um, the negotiation leading up to the Arctic Council, we always been active in that work, you know, and we now believe that you know it should be uh, Greenland that leads and heads the work in the Arctic Council, uh, as the country and people of Greenland are the proper representatives uh, of the Arctic in the kingdom. You know, and what, have, what I have just alluded to, you know, is the evolving relationship uh, between Greenland and Denmark, you know, where we are working uh, to continually expand our autonomy, uh, but which is directly tied to the development of our economy, where we entering into issues like natural resource development, you know, which plays a big part. Um, so it's, it, I mean, it can quickly become kind of a complicated kind of picture, but you know, we need to keep, uh, I think, uh, the focus uh, uh, right, you know, and proper. And I think the issue uh, of representation is therefore important to us. Um, as I said, you know, we've been active in the creation of, um, up to the um, up to the creation of the Act of Council, and ever since. Um, because we, we believe that, you know, uh, that um, cooperation is important. The Arctic Council is where the, all the Arctic, uh, eight Arctic countries are represented directly, uh, the governments. So it's the only kind of a governmental forum where um, you have both uh, Russia and United States as well as the others uh, uh, sitting there. And they've been, I mean, we, uh, we've been doing important work in the Arctic Council over the years. I mean, you know, dealing with environment, uh, uh, you know, contaminants to climate change and um, and other issues, and all. I mean, the Arctic Council also, um, um, you know, created these task forces, you know, which led to the finding international agreements um, uh, on oil spill, uh, oil spill prevention as well as um, the search and rescue. Um, but you know. Um, but it's also, I mean, some critics would say, I think, uh, very rigid um, kind of, uh, they have very rigid procedures in terms of engaging with other countries, you know, and where I think we've seen other forests like the Arctic Circle and, and others, you know, where, where I think countries outside the Arctic which, which uh, are seeking, I think, um, interest in Arctic issues, you know, coming together with, uh, with us, as, you know, with other Arctic countries. And, and having a discussion because I think shunning them out, you know, it's, it's not the answer. You know, it's not the, I think, correct response. We have to somehow, you know, engage with them, but at the same time, you know, assert that, you know, it is us who are living in the Arctic that, uh, you know, should be, I think, you know, the, the proper, um, uh, are the proper right holders of the, and have the right to, uh, to uh, and power to determine our own futures. I'm sure we'll get into a lot of, you know, the different issues relating to this. So I think I'll stop there and hand, um, and hand over the microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anitek. Um, 
So let me uh, just mention, remind the audience before I turn over the floor to uh, Daly. Uh, if you have questions in mind, please use the Q&A function that you'll see uh, on the bottom ribbon of your screen. Uh, I'm going to uh, direct questions and answers after all three speakers have had a chance uh, to give their opening presentations. And now without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor to Daly. Vienna, thank you very much, uh, David. Also to Xander and all of your uh, colleagues, the whole team at University of Pennsylvania Law School. I think this is an extraordinary opportunity for uh, students there, especially who aspire to work in uh, the realm of law and public international law in particular. Uh, this is, to me, a fascinating uh, area of of study and scholarship. Uh, so I just look forward to um, seeing many of your faces and your work in the future. My um, comments will uh, focus upon the work of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. And I'll try to give a, a quick primer and then sum up with some of the issues that Inutup has already referenced in terms of environmental security and uh, a host of other issues. The Inuit Circumpolar Council is a non-governmental organization representing approximately 180,000 Inuit throughout Chikaka and the Russian Far East, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. And it's important for me to make note of the fact that Inuit as Arctic indigenous peoples are distinct peoples. And when I say this, I, I mean that we hold pre-existing or inherent rights as distinct peoples. We have a historical experience, of course, with colonization, but uh, those experiences have not uh, dramatically altered our collective rights as distinct peoples or our individual rights as distinct peoples. It's also important to point out the significance of the collective political right of self-determination as understood in international law and its attachment to us as distinct peoples. It's also crucial to understand that there's an important and profound spiritual relationship that we as Inuit, as Arctic indigenous peoples have to our lands, territories, and environment. We have the right to be different and to be respected as such. And we also have a holistic worldview. We understand like human rights or the nature of human rights that everything is interrelated, interdependent and indivisible. So if you adjust or alter or disrupt one element, all other elements are disrupted and disturbed as well. For me, it's important that we recognize this in the context of the work of the Arctic Council. And we were fortunate to have a, a, a wide array of Inuit diplomats who engaged in the early organizing of the Arctic Council. And Inutuk, I greatly appreciate his comment about uh, the work of the Inuit Circumpolar Council in terms of environmental security. Indeed, the Inuit Circumpolar Council played a crucial role in identifying important principles and elements to safeguard the Arctic environment, largely because we have this profound relationship with the Arctic environment, both the lands and the coastal seas and the Arctic Ocean itself. Indeed, Eben Hobson, who's recognized as the founder of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, in his welcoming remarks to delegates in June of 1977, when we first organized ourselves and united our blood relations from across the whole of the uh, Arctic circumpolar traditional homelands or Inuit Nunat, stated, our language contains the intricate knowledge of the ice that we have seen no others demonstrate. Without our central involvement, 
there can be no safe and responsible Arctic resource development. Of course, at the time, the context was the potential for offshore oil and gas development, as well as a host of other threats to our environmental security. He also highlighted the important need for the Arctic nations, the Arctic five coastal states or littoral states, as well as the other Arctic eight states, or including the Arctic eight states, that there had to be respect uniform respect for our rights as indigenous peoples. So his effort was not only to unite us in order for us to have a voice at the international level, but also to ensure that we had an organization to advocate for our distinct rights. So it's in this context that we became involved in the work of the Arctic Council. Uh, indeed, as I said earlier, uh, Inuit diplomats like Mary Simon and many others uh, helped to formulate the language of the Ottawa Declaration adopted in 1996 and seen as the organic document for the Arctic Council um, today. Uh, on the basis of the various different directives and mandates that we adopt at our general assemblies, which are held every four years, uh, we've identified uh, priorities that we will work in within the Arctic Council, but also internationally within the United Nations and other intergovernmental fora. In this regard, I just want to point out that as a permanent participant in the Arctic Council, We've become very active in the Arctic Contaminants Action Program Working Group. Uh, Inutuk mentioned some of the working groups of the Arctic Council, and that's one of them. Uh, and that work is based upon our concern about contaminants uh, in the Arctic or the subject matter of the Stockholm Convention, as well as the Minamata Convention. Because of our uh, important relationship with the marine environment and its biodiversity, we're also active in the working group entitled Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna, where we focused on biodiversity, but also we have focused on indigenous knowledge, the profound uh, accumulated wealth of knowledge that Inuit have with regard to the Arctic the very information that Hobson was speaking of, the knowledge that we have about the sea ice as well as the rest of the Arctic environment. We're involved in the protection of the Arctic marine environment or the PAME working group because of our reliance, our heavy dependence upon the marine environment. More recently, uh, we're beginning to talk about our values in relation to this marine environment and specifically uh, the ecosystem, ecosystems that they represent. We're also very active in the Sustainable Development Working Group and concerned about the health and wellness of our communities because as I said earlier, everything is interrelated and that if there are uh, disruptions or interference in one place, Health and wellness are impacted. Our youth are impacted. Uh, we're also involved in the Sustainable Development Working Group because of the significant infrastructure deficit that has been more acutely revealed in the context of the pandemic. Um, so the other working groups we have uh, focused less upon, but uh, those are the ones that we have decided are priorities for the moment. Before leaving this discussion, I do want to say that um, we have become increasingly concerned about the role of the observers to the Arctic Council. We as indigenous peoples, and because of the Ottawa Declaration adopted in 1996, hold the status of permanent participants, largely because of our distinct status as indigenous peoples, which I referred to earlier. This is kind of chafed at some of the observers who want to play an increasing influential role in all Arctic issues. And um, this is an area where we have to remain vigilant as the original inhabitants 
of the Arctic region. In fact, if you look at the traditional territories of Inuit we occupy, just over 40% of the Arctic, and we rely upon uh, those coastal seas and the Arctic Ocean and the interrelated nature of the Arctic Ocean. So it's imperative that there be recognition of our distinct status, our distinct rights, and our distinct role within the Arctic Council, as well as other intergovernmental fora. And when I say other intergovernmental fora, I mean across the globe. The questions about uh, the significance and importance of environmental security have everything to do with us the concerns about economic security. And when we think about the Arctic in relation to high politics and the interests of certainly three of the permanent members of the Security Council, this is where we have to be vigilant and alert uh, because it's going to impact our economic security, our cultural security, our food security, our environmental security. So. It's imperative that the human rights of Inuit, the human rights of Arctic indigenous peoples becomes a common theme, a norm within all of the discussions concerning uh, the Arctic region and all of the issues that begin to directly impact and affect us. As Anutak has said, the people who live within the region have to have a seat at the table and, in, and, and with a growing interest across the globe and geopolitically, it means that we have to have a seat at every table. And that's a daunting task uh, for a modest organization like the Inuit Circumpolar Council, but it, the stakes are high. And uh, because of uh, a whole host of reasons, we need to play a, a direct and meaningful role within the framework of our human rights. So I'll um, yield there and uh, look forward to the questions uh, being posed by participants. And uh, again, Priyanak, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Daly. Thank you very much. And now our last speaker, uh, Lassi Hannanen, floor is yours, sir. Thank you so much, uh, David. Uh, it's my, my great uh, pleasure to, to join this uh, uh, last session of, of a very important uh, conference. Uh, though it would be very, very nice to, to, to be there in person, but in, in this situation, it's not possible. So let's do it uh, so that I'm, I'm speaking here Saturday night uh, in, in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, as a political scientist, uh, I would like to, to broaden the scope a little bit and, and start by uh, describing the current state of Arctic governance and uh, governance and, and geopolitics. Um, and it's interesting that the basic knowledge, knowledge reveals that uh, there is high geopolitical stability and constructive cooperation, despite of uh, different uh, perceptions, narratives, false alarms, uh, mis and disinformation. And this is this is rather interesting uh, because it's it's man-made. It is something what the Arctic states wanted to 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 have when when uh, when they started the cooperation. Uh, 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 more than 30 years ago. So that was uh, exactly uh, try to ha have a, a lower military uh, tension and uh, increase uh, political stability and cooperation. And indeed, I mean, they have managed to do that. So I have tried to describe that, that, that uh, the Arctic states, they have uh, went beyond the hegemonic uh, great power game and the Cold War costs as former enemy pictures. And they have reshaped and reconstructed their uh, geopolitical reality. 
because they wanted to protect the, the, the environment. They wanted to have cooperation on uh, fields of low politics in order to build confidence and trust. And an interesting thing is that this started in the end of the Cold War, not after the end of the Cold War, because it, it started already in 19, uh, late 1980s. Then the Cold War ended, so it was even more important to have this confidence. Uh, and now, of course, now the point is how to maintain the stability, how to main the, maintain the constructive cooperation. And, and uh, I mean, this is very much dealing with governance, the rule of law. And, and because, I mean, we know that there is not any legally binding Arctic Treaty just now. Maybe someday, I don't know, but it's not realistic uh, call just now. But however, there are several uh, soft law measures uh, how uh, confidence has been managed to build. An Arctic uh, Council has been mentioned. That is, of course, the main um, uh, soft law policy shaping platform. But, but of course, we have to understand that it was established for cooperation on environmental protection and to, to build sustainable development in the Arctic. So the mandate uh, was limited and the mandate is still limited. And, and of course, that, that is giving some kind of, of, of uh, uh, limits what, what, uh, we, what the, the Council can do. But, but I would, however, it has been successful story so far. And, and then of course we, ha we, we have to remember that in addition of, of, of these soft law uh, uh, regime measures, we have the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And, and that is very important uh, dealing with the Arctic Ocean. And what is the Arctic region? It's, it's very much about the Arctic Ocean. So these together are, are there saying that there, I mean, to me, there are no reasons to use words like threat, threat picture, uh, co conflict, armed conflict, when, it, when we talk about the Arctic today. In spite of all, all like I said, the different perceptions and false alarms. But instead, I would say that there are challenges there are big problems, but I mean, what are those? They are something, they are phenomena which you can solve. So uh, un unlike a threat, which is very psychological. So of course, the, we have the real problem and that is the rapidly advanced climate change in the Arctic, particularly warming off the Arctic. And, and I mean, this has discussed uh, very widely, very broadly uh, in, the, in, the, in the last two, two decades since the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment 2004. But actually, scientifically and partly uh, secretly, climate, has, uh, climate change in the Arctic has been known for 70 years when it uh, became a U.S. national security concern, even before the Cold War became hot. So it's 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 not actually that new, but of course the new thing is that it is um, advanced so rapidly, and and it's it's really I mean we have all the uh, reasons to be very worried about. The stakes are high, as uh, Daly mentioned, but uh, actually. It's even worse. It's the combination of climate change, pollution, and loss of biodiversity. And to me, that is that big problem. I'm not, uh, I mean, I would, I'm very concerned on, on this, much more concerned than, than uh, military threat by Russia or China or some other actor in the Arctic. And as if this wouldn't be enough, we just um, uh, launched uh, uh, last uh, uh, scientific report on, on, on large uh, uh, survey on, on, we went through all the Arctic strategies and policies. And 
the first overall trend based on 56 documents is that whenever a balance is sought between environmental protection and climate change mitigation vis-a-vis -vis increase of economic activities, there is ambivalence. There is a paradox. And the paradox is that the Arctic states are hesitating to, 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 to make the hard decisions to implement climate change mitigation. So there is political inability. And, and so, so this together to me is, is, is a real big problem. Uh, the good thing is that at the same time, the Arctic states and the observer states and also uh, permanent participants, they lean on science. So there is very clear trend that focus on science, particularly when it comes to climate change and environmental uh, protection. But then, of course, I mean, that's not enough if there is this po political inability to make the hard decisions when it's needed and the time is now. Well, I mean, there is some sort of state domination behind there. And then that there is the related fate of uh, security political elite to believe in national unilateral competitive military security. And in the Arctic region, this means, of course, the nuclear weapon systems of the USA and those of Russia. So it's heavily militarized at the same time when you have high geopolitical stability. And this is something which is not that often happening, but, but today we have that. Uh, but that military presence is, is first of all for the uh, global nuclear deterrence of, of the leading nuclear weapon powers. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm not at all thinking that they would use it in the Arctic, no. But it's there just some kind of certainty. Um, at the same time, uh, there is another narrative, and that is the global Arctic. Uh, it was mentioned that there are more and more interests uh, toward the Arctic from outside of the Arctic states. Uh, indeed, uh, the Arctic uh, has become globalized, and the global Arctic is a new multifunctional geopolitical context. It consists of global impacts within the Arctic region and worldwide implications by the globalized Arctic. And this is a very interesting phenomenon because it can be, I mean, global impacts are mostly negative toward the Arctic, but uh, implications by the globalized Arctic uh, can be also positive. And I would say here like uh, immaterial issues like knowledge, like uh, indigenous traditional environmental knowledge, which the previous speakers mentioned. I mean, this is something what is playing more and more uh, important role worldwide. But there are also Lassie, other... Lassie, I'm hoping you can wrap up sometime yeah, soon. Yeah, I will. Uh, other issues dealing with the legal innovations in po political le and legal uh, arrangements. So, all in all, I mean, uh, the Arctic is very important uh, in world politics. And the Arctic paradox, which I mentioned, is not inevitable, as much depends on the criteria by which the Arctic states make the decisions. So it is totally possible that they will, in order to maintain high stability and much uh, constructive cooperation, they will start real uh, acts for climate change mitigations. And this is something what I really would like to see happening as soon as possible. Thank you. And thank you, Lassie, very much. So we already have a number of questions that have come in from the audience. I encourage others who are listening to uh, send in their questions as well. Um, I'm going to start by combining a question from Ian Bayer to Inatech with a question to Inatech of my own. Um, Inatech, you you mentioned in the course of your presentation the evolving relationship between Greenland and Denmark. And as you look into the future um, with the prospect of um, uh, perhaps new instruments and arrangements for the Arctic, 
Um, how is that relationship between Greenland and Denmark likely to evolve further? Uh, do, you, do you foresee Greenland attaining greater autonomy, particularly in uh, areas of foreign relations? And uh, related to that, uh, Ian asks, um, there was, a, I don't know how serious it was, uh, 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 an expression of interest in the part of the United States to buy Greenland at one point. Um, that didn't go very well. But um, is, are there ways in which you uh, can see that the United States can strengthen its, its relationship with Greenland and with the Kingdom of Denmark as a whole? What do you think? Well, uh, to your first questions, uh, you're right. I mean, the current um, uh, relationship that's been uh, written down in the law is from 2009. You know, uh, and um, I mean, there are different elements in that also, but there's also, um, interestingly enough, you know, um, a chapter on secession, uh, uh, which the people of Greenland, uh, you know, if we go that far, you know, has the right to take uh, in a referendum. Uh, but there's, there's a list of like, I think there's like 32 areas, you know, ranging from, you know, diving regulations to justice, you know, uh, um, that uh, we haven't taken taken over yet, you know. But uh, our our goal um, is to continue to uh, you know take over responsibilities. And uh, I think um, um, something that we have I think learned you know from seventy nine when we first acquired home rule is that whenever you take home an area, there's also an external aspect to that. You know, take for example fisheries. You know, when we uh, that we've been in control of you know since. We've got a home rule. I mean, you have entered into you know bilateral um, fisheries um, agreements with neighboring countries as well as you know and um, represent the kingdom in, in the uh, different fisheries ma management organizations um, in the region. So I mean that will continue. You know that's our aim. But as I said in my uh, introductory presentation, it's very tied to the. Um, Economic development because we have to we have to pay ourselves whenever we take over an area, uh, as opposed to the old arrangement, you know, where money followed, uh, you know, from Denmark. Because um, now, you know, we, the goal is also to reduce the the block grant that we get from Denmark, which is about six hundred fifty million a year. Um, so, and to the second question, uh, I mean. We've been uh, engaged with the U.S. In, I think in a constructive uh, way. Um, you know what happened. You know last uh, August last year. You know we see it as a minor thumb, but we, our focus has been to have a constructive kind of um, building of the relations. And we actually seeing that. I think the fruition of those right now. I mean the U.S. U.S. We opened the consulate in Nook um, just recently. Um, when I said we open, you know, U.S. has a, had a consulate in Nuuk in from 1942 to 53, um, and I mean we are engaging in, in a dialogue, you know, uh, with different, um, um, you know, um, federal departments, you know, on expanding in cooperation on, you know, from minerals to energy to education, tourism. I mean, there's a whole range of issues that we are. Um, Working on it together with the U.S., so um, you know, I think it's um, we have taken some positive steps, you know, between the U.S. and Greenland uh, in that. So. Okay, thanks very much, Daly. Um, we have a question in from Kelsey Hawk, I believe, and I'd like to combine it with one of my own for you. Uh, you mm -hmm. spoke about the need for Arctic Indigenous peoples to have a seat at the table everywhere that their interests are being considered, right? Um, to be part of the decision-making processes. Kelsey asks, how do you go about that in practice? And in particular, from my perspective, we spoke about this earlier, you and I, um, as new types of instruments for the Arctic may be developed in the future, particularly binding instruments, are there ways to have indigenous peoples have the same sorts of participatory rights and legally binding regimes that they have, say, in the Arctic Council? What do you think? Yeah, I think, thank you very much, Kelsey, for the question. I should note that I believe, she, I, I don't know how many other Inuit 
or at University of Pennsylvania, but I'm pleased to see an Anouk uh, uh, engaged in uh, not only law school, but also this gathering. This is an important question. And I think we, we as indigenous peoples globally have made some extraordinary advances to insist that we have a seat at the table. Um, there's an ongoing discussion even within the United Nations uh, General Assembly about uh, the direct participation of indigenous peoples um, within the General Assembly and specifically our governments. Uh, the, the UN regime has a, a place for non-governmental organizations like the Inuit Circumpolar Council, but what about the governments? What about the indigenous governments? What about the Inuit governments that have extraordinary responsibility in terms of their, their status, their rights, their role, their authority, and their jurisdiction. And it's on that basis that I think that uh, to respond to your uh, specific um, line of questioning about international uh, a, a regime or a treaty or a, a method, a mechanism to ensure that uh, Inuit and other Arctic Indigenous peoples do have a guaranteed seat at the table. I think that this is an area that needs exploration. I have always felt that our permanent participant status was insufficient. Uh, I think that um, the rules of procedure and, and having a place as a permanent participant is one thing, but when it comes down to very serious issues um, like the, the legally binding uh, agreements that were incubated within the Arctic Council and then emerged as legally binding agreements, and now with the advance of the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement, uh, and references to indigenous knowledge, indigenous peoples, and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, complemented by the reality, especially for Inuit, of significant land claims policy in Alaska, the extraordinary extent of rights entrenched in the comprehensive land claims agreements in Canada, as well as the status and conditions of, of Greenland government that Anutuk has, uh, has uplifted in this conversation, we, we not only have a right to uh, play an equitable role within any international agreement, but we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to our people to safeguard the environmental security we're concerned about, the economic security we're concerned about, the cultural security that we're uh, concerned about. And I just quickly will conclude by, by thanking Lassie for mentioning the, the significance and importance of of climate change. Uh, clearly, this is a, a major driving issue. But I would also say that though within the Arctic and within the Arctic Council, certainly, people are not talking about threats and uh, uh, instability. There are separate actions, especially by, uh, by the Russian Federation and by China, they're separate and distinct actions and their interest in the Arctic can have deleterious effects for uh, Arctic indigenous peoples and for Inuit. So it's along these lines that we have to be vigilant about China's interest in their own economic security, their own food security, their own energy security, and also uh, vigilant about what the Russian Federation is doing in terms of their military fortifications, extractive industries, et cetera. So, Thank you. Sorry to have um, uh, abused the time, but <laughs> hardly, hardly daily. Uh, we have a question from Patrick Lynn that could actually go to any of you, but I think I'd like to start with Lassie if he's willing. And I, I paraphrase it this way: um, a number of you have touched on, particularly Daly and um, Inotech, about how the Arctic states and the Arctic indigenous peoples uh, want, in the first instance, to be making the decisions about the Arctic. It is, after all their home, they're the ones most affected by uh, conditions in the Arctic. But Patrick points out that, as we've often said, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. And as the Arctic is melting, um, the effects on the rest of the world 
are increasing, and that is driving a lot of interest. A number of you spoke about this in the Arctic. Um, some of you were suggesting we need to be vigilant about um, not giving non-Arctic states or other players from outside the region undue influence. But if we, as Arctic states and Arctic peoples, pursue that too strongly, is there a risk that these others may try to take decision making to some other place like the, like the UN or some other body? Uh, and uh, we wind up actually losing control over what is going on in the Arctic. And it's a, an interesting question to me. And Lassie, I'll turn to you first, but if the others uh, wish to speak about this as well, I'll give you the chance. Lassie, what do you think about this? Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's really good question. And uh, we have discussed this, this for some time. Uh, I mean, many people, many participants of, of this session might might uh, know that uh, there was a uh, big bank of, of new uh, observers who, who, who accepted to become observers of the Arctic Council 2013. But actually this discussion has started much earlier. And, and I would uh, say that first it, it was science. I mean, uh, interest to, to come and do research in the Arctic. And, and like the International Polar Year was something that, that outsiders were invited to come. And that was the moment when, for example, China started its research in the Arctic. And then, of course, climate change. And I mean, I, I have tried to, to, to uh, emphasize the fact that indeed there are so many countries outside the Arctic region who are very worried about the, the, uh, the, the, the global warming. And that's why they would like to know what is going on. And that's why they are there doing research. So, so I, I, I wouldn't uh, underestimate the, the role of science, the role of climate change uh, to have more information there. And uh, I mean, yeah, we should invite them as they have been invited we should uh, have discussion with them because actually the Arctic states, the eight Arctic states, they have nothing to worry about because of the state sovereignty, what they have. Then the question is, of course, Arctic indigenous peoples, but that is so often uh, within, within uh, Arctic states, the discussion except in Iceland, how to do that. Of course, there are several uh, environmental issues which are very important for indigenous people. Uh, like in Finland, the Sami people. Finland has not ratified ILO 169 convention yet. At the same time, when, when we say that we very much uh, respect our Sami people. So, so they're, they're, that is not fixed yet at, at, at all. But at the same time, in a way, we can invite those outsiders because this, I mean, the Arctic matters so much globally. Mm. Okay. Haley or Intertech, do either of you have something to add to this? Haley, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I think it's actually a foregone conclusion. If you think about the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Arctic is, uh, is central to the globe, uh, temperatures, ocean currents, a whole host of things. So uh, on one hand, um, we have, uh, uh, just by virtue of these other international um, treaties, uh, mention of UNCLOS, for example. Uh, here again, it's a, it's a global treaty. Um, so to some extent that outsiders and the host of observer governments now engaged in the Arctic Council um, and, and the potential for the influence that they have over these issues, they're taking actions within these other intergovernmental organization fora that have direct impacts upon us. Um, but uh, more to the heart of um, your earlier question about uh, the possibility for some additional regime uh, and a hard law regime in terms of the Arctic, uh, it would be um, worth exploring some uh, 
potential for a comprehensive agreement that is um, uh, put in place amongst the Arctic eight states. Uh, there was reference to the Alulisset Declaration earlier and the, the questions of, of state sovereignty. And when we come to that issue, you know, that state sovereignty does have its limitations. If in fact we, if in fact we look at the the, the right of self-determination as it has evolved in international law and the requirements that states even put upon themselves. And I make this point because it's important for indigenous peoples and the exercise of their self-determination to gain that seat at the table. Kelsey's question I think is, is really, really significant if we hold it against the backdrop of a dialogue, an intellectually honest dialogue about state sovereignty and the limitations of state sovereignty as understood in international law. And I think that um, it would be it would be worth uh, exploring um, the potential and um, and also to think about it in a comprehensive fashion because even the Arctic Council has its limitations where directly economic development activity is has been quartered within the Arctic Economic Council. Issues of, of defense and security are not on the table within the Arctic Council. Um, so uh, it's 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 worth um, a glass of wine and a lot of talk. Yeah. <laughs> and I look forward to sharing one with you someday soon. Talk yeah. some more about this. Inatech, what do you yeah. think? This is very short. I mean, on you know, on the role of you know the non-Arctic states. I mean, I think we have to look at contrast there. You know, because um, you know, there, there's a there's an ocean in the uh, in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, I mean, uh, piece of the um, Arctic Ocean that's. Um, uh, outside the exclusive economic zones, and you know, and you let the negotiations on the creation of the moratorium of the fisheries, you know, agreement. So, um, you know, where the non-Arctic states, you know, uh, participate, but but the rest, I think, if we look at you know, um, you know, the geography of the Arctic, and you know, what uh, UNCLOS governs, you know, if that's very clear. So there's, you know, that kind of, um, then you have that, you know, piece of the ocean that's um, outside the 200 uh, you know, sea miles. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have a question from Christopher Jacobs so I'd like to come back to, and um, I'll give it a little bit of context here. Lassie pointed out, and Dali mentioned again, that there is, as we sit here today, no comprehensive agreement for the Arctic comparable to, say, the Antarctic Treaty and its attendant uh, instruments for the Antarctic. But we do have now three binding agreements that have come through the Arctic Council process. We have the Arctic Fisheries Agreement coming online. We have through the International Maritime Organization, the Polar Code. Um, and what Christopher asks, I think in connection with these types of instruments, is whether they have enforcement mechanisms. He wants to know how can states be held accountable or how can some states hold other states accountable for their actions uh, in light of these, these commitments that they have taken. Do any of you wish to try to address that? <laughs> I mean, I could say a word about it, but you want me to. Um, well, um, to the extent that these instruments relate to the activities of vessels at sea, uh, there is a regime for enforcement when vessels are on the high seas beyond the jurisdiction of any country, it's generally only the, um, the state that, uh, in which the vessel is registered, the flag state that has responsibility for the actions. And so it's the flag state that is responsible for enforcing um, uh, against violations. When vessels are in uh, areas under jurisdiction of coastal states, then those states actually have enforcement jurisdiction as well. And of course, there are some of these agreements um, um, relating to search and rescue, for example, also apply on land territory. And there, uh, countries have, countries have, of course, the right to take enforcement action within their territory. Um, that said, the regime for the Arctic, as it relates, the international law regime for the Arctic, as it relates to enforcement, suffers from the same general problems as we see everywhere in the world. It's not easy 
to hold countries fully accountable for the commitments they have made under uh, under agreements. It typically is not compulsory and binding dispute settlement under uh, most agreements of the world, though there are there is with respect to some. Anyway, there's a lot more that could be said on that point. Uh, that that may be all. Um, we're coming to the end of time. Daly, please, if you want yeah, to add. I, I, I might mention that uh, we see this issue and problem, especially in the area of human rights and accountability for, for human rights records on the part of um, UN member states. And I think that, that uh, something akin to the Universal Periodic Review, um, for example, in terms of, of, of state behavior and compliance, um, we have we have so many diverse and um, discrete agreements and activities that that it really does kind of beg the question um, uh, that you posed earlier of uh, what about a, a regime that is specific to the Arctic and would allow for, um, you know, kind of peacefully uh, negotiated and arrived at by consensus and uh, allowing for uh, some kind of a, a check on uh, state behavior for Arctic specific uh, issues. Th this would be another just fascinating element of, uh, of, of something that is done on, on a regional basis that has more teeth. But regardless, we, we will always face these kinds of issues. And I think that the, the rights ritualism that's practiced within the domain of human rights uh, at the UN is um, an unfortunate uh, example of lack of state compliance and, and uh, good behavior. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Daly. And Tech, did you want to add something to this? We're almost out of time. I'll give yeah, you just very short to follow up. I think, you know, all habits die hard. The Arctic um, is uh, still reading from the, its colonial past, you know, and the, you know, the member states are very protective of their kind of, uh, you know, um, the, the sovereign kind of a, a sovereign rights, you know, um, within the Arctic. And that you can see in the Arctic Council as well. Indeed. Well, friends, I feel as though we're just, we've just scratched the surface. There's a lot more that could be said about all of this. Unfortunately, we are out of time. And so for those of you who are uh, watching, please join me in thanking our three distinguished speakers, Anatek Holm Olsen, Daily Doro, Asi Heinenen for excellent presentations. Thank you all for uh, responding to the questions as well as you did. And now I'd like to turn the floor over once again to, uh, to Xander. Thank you so much, uh, David. And uh, I wanna be joined by my uh, faculty director of Cyril, Claire Finkelstein. Uh, we as well thank all four of you for your participation today. We truly do uh, appreciate it. Um, and everyone who has participated in any aspect of this conference. Uh, Claire, do you wanna say a word? Uh, yes, you? first of all, uh, I'd like to thank all of our participants. Uh, it is wonderful. There are some small advantages to being on Zoom. Uh, we would have really liked to be able to welcome you in person, but I don't know whether or not we would have had such a broad array of uh, international visitors and uh, participants and, uh, and people from all over the place. So uh, there are upsides and downsides and, and I'm very, very happy uh, that we were able to have such robust discussions over the course of the last few days. I'd just like to thank again our partners uh, for this event, the Annenberg Public Policy Center uh, here at University of Pennsylvania. We've been thrilled to be able to partner with them. Uh, and uh, it's uh, a, been a very um, interesting partnership to partner with a communications center. Uh, we are primarily a, a national security and rule of law center. And it turns out that there is enormous fertile ground there to be shared. And uh, the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center, the uh, from what I know of the subject area, the Polar Institute is really the premier place where uh, knowledge of this subject matter is being developed in, in so many different areas. And so they have been our subject matter experts, along with my colleague, Xander Mize, who has uh, led us on this project all the way through. We'll be editing our volume that will be coming out 
and continuing to direct our efforts. So it's been an honor and a privilege to have her leadership on this. And uh, I'm very grateful to her as well as to our other partners and to my team, uh, uh, Rich Meyer, our uh, interim executive director. He is uh, not uh, able to reveal himself on the call, but I'd just like to thank him. And uh, Elizabeth Olip, our director of events, who uh, did a fantastic job and Eileen Kenny, our Director of Engagement. So thank you so much. And Christopher Jacobs, who is our other senior fellow, uh, who directed one of the panels. So thanks to all of you. We'll be looking forward to sharing uh, intellectual content in this area. We hope that there are uh, future work that we can continue to develop together. And I'll be very much looking forward to the, uh, to, to the volume and seeing how that shapes up. Thank you so much, Claire. And I think this was such a fitting end to our conference. We started off with a public session talking about how Arctic nations can better engage their Arctic partners in cooperation to advance security in the Arctic. And as we've heard over the last few days, there's such an intersection of these economic interests, hu uh, human interests, the hard security interests. And if we're going to address those, we need good governance mechanisms. And you today in this session teased out some of the the tensions there and some gaps that need filling. Um, and so I look forward to seeing how this um, uh, develops. I mean, Arctic security is US security, is global security, is climate security, and you cannot pull these issues apart. And so uh, we will have more programming, as Claire said, a conference report on this topic as well. I encourage you, if you're not already on Cyril's mailing list to join it, you will receive emails regarding our series on our blog regarding uh, climate and national security issues as well as other, as other relevant pieces as they come out. So thank everybody again. I hope you have a wonderful Saturday afternoon and we look forward to someday seeing you in person at University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank Good you. Bye-bye.